Hey, good morning. My name is Troy, one of the pastors here. So glad you're with us today. Um, I'm also one of the founding pastors of Generations Church. We started the church about 19 years ago. And I was just thinking, I'm, I wonder if there's some people here today who maybe have been in Southport area for like 19 or 20 days. And um, you're brand new here and you decided to check us out in person or maybe you're watching online thinking about coming in person and, um, and and maybe some of you have been here a long time but it's your first time in church in a long time maybe something happened in your life and so I just want to tell you I, we are so honored that you're here today and that you chose to uh, to try out Generations Church and 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 maybe maybe for you try out the Lord and the Bible and this whole Christianity thing. So we're honored. And if there's something we can do as a church, so here's our mission. Our mission is to invite people who are far from God to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Because a lot of people in this room, we're all in. We're fully devoted. We want you to be there with us because we think it's the best way to live this life and all eternity. One step at a time, that's the end of it. Like we, we know it doesn't happen overnight. So if we can help you take a spiritual step today, maybe one step closer to God, that, that, would, be, uh, that would just be an answer to prayer for us. So um, you can, if you have questions, we can help in any way. 94,000 is the way to uh, let us know. You text that number and then the word GC Connect, and I'll put that on the screen later in the service as well. Um, or you can stop by guest services after the service. We'll give you a free gift. Um, I'll be in the lobby. Love to meet you. I got to meet a few people this morning who are brand new after the early service. And so that, that would be amazing. Um, so we're continuing our series today called Cornerstone, where we're going through the book of Ephesians, a new te- book in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote it to the church at Ephesus in the first century. Um, is a church in the Asia area, a real important city uh, in the first century. And so we're, we're just going through that book. And the reason we call it a cornerstone is because you, you'll see today, and, and if you were here last week, you saw it, there, if we're going to build the house, if we're calling the Christian life the house, we're building the house, we've got to have a strong foundation, have to have a good cornerstone to the building. And so uh, th- this is some cornerstone information, like if you're wanting to know more about Christianity, you know, how salvation works, all that, it's a great series to be a part of. A couple months ago, we were in Cairo, Egypt, myself and some folks from our church took a trip to Israel and Egypt, and we visited the Egyptian museum. And in the Egyptian museum, it, it was a fascinating look at, like most of the relics in the museum were from the period of the pharaohs. So great, think of Great Pyramid, you know, the pharaoh would get buried in there with all his treasure, um, and because he thought he was going, taking it with him to the afterlife. And then eventually there were grave robbers, so they quit getting buried, and they quit building pyramids, and they started getting buried in caves and all that. And so the, the Egyptian museum was, was from that period, and it was, I'll be honest, it was fascinating, but it was also deeply troubling to me because... You know, I'm a, I'm a history student and I'm a, I'm a Bible guy. And so I'm doing the math in my brain and I'm going, okay. Because one of the things they told us is when Abraham visited Egypt, the Great Pyramid had already been there 500 years. And I'm going, okay, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Whole world gets destroyed by a flood. Noah and his sons, three sons are Ham, Shem, and Japheth. They're the ones who repopulate the earth. And there's a genealogy in the book of Genesis, Shem's genealogy, where, you know, Shem begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, and eventually gets to Abraham. And I don't know how long that genealogy lasts, less than a thousand years, whatever, however long it took for that to get to Abraham. So this is the thought that I had in my brain. When we reject God and we reject his word, we get insane fast. Like, you're, so you people in Egypt, you're burying yourself. And by the way, you didn't want to be a servant of Pharaoh when Pharaoh died because... They're killing you and they're burying you in there with him because he needs you in the afterlife. So so this mindset, this bad theology that goes, we can bury all our treasure with us because we'll have in the afterlife. Like it didn't take long until God destroyed the entire earth with a flood until people moved down to Egypt and had that whack theology. But that's not the the sermon today. That's just a total rabbit trail. But I just had to (laughs) throw that out there 
Like, what in the world? But anyway, one of the displays in the Egyptian Museum was a display of this guy named Yuya, Y-U-Y-A, and Thuya. So these were not pharaohs, but they were the mother and father-in-law of one of the pharaohs. And they discovered them in one of these caves, and they had been you know, embalmed, body embalmed, and they were in a casket, and, and sometimes they would bury them in two or three caskets. And they were in this cave, and, and they were preserved, which is kind of crazy because it was behind a, a glass display, so the picture's not great, but you can make out the head right here. And normally when we bury somebody, like they're worm dirt, you know, a couple of weeks, I don't know how long it takes to decompose a body, but it's gone, you know. This thing is 3,000 years old and it's, you know, you can actually make out the body. It's kind of crazy. Um, and so anyway, um, so I, I bring this up because I want to I test your medical knowledge this morning. Let's say, okay, so go with me here. I'm going to make up this story, but let's say that, I steal Yuya out of the Egyptian Museum. It's like that movie National Treasure where they stole stuff from museums. Okay, we're stealing him from the museum. And I fly him over to America, put him in the back of my truck, put you in my truck, and I go, okay, we're going to head over to the funeral home. We'll go over to Peacock Noonan Funeral Home. I know Rick and Shauna Sanders, they run the place. And I go in there and we go, I go, look, I need your freshest body. Whatever just came in. And they go, oh, yeah, we got a fresh one. Now, they're professionals. They wouldn't say that. But this is my story, okay? We're making this up. <laughs> and they go, yeah, we got a fresh one. Died three hours ago. So we take Yuya out of the back of the truck. We, we take him inside the funeral home. We lay him on the table next to a fresh body. Been dead three hours. Yuya, you can tell they've been dead a while. The one who's been dead three hours, I mean... There's no rigor mortis. There's no decomposition. I mean, they almost still have, they almost look like they're sleeping. Like there's not even discoloring really happening yet. They're just like, just like they're sleeping. And I turn to you, testing your medical knowledge. And I say to you, I ask you this question, which one is deader? Which one is more dead? And you look at me like this is a trick question. What are you talking about? They're, they're both dead. They're not degrees of deadness. You know, if the heart is not beating, if the heart's not pumping blood, dead, expired, they gone. Both of them are completely dead. Now, when we're talking about physical death, pretty easy to spot, isn't it? Heart's not beating, they're dead. But what about spiritual death? Physical death's easy. What about spiritual death? How do you spot that? Like, can someone be alive and be spiritually dead? So if we went on another field trip, took you to the state prison, we went to death row, asked for an inmate in there who, maybe this guy's killed multiple people. He comes out and visits us, and he looks at us like he wants to kill us. He just looks mean. There's hate in his eyes. We know what he's done. He hasn't made restitution for anything. And we walk out of there and we go, man, that dude, he needs Jesus. <laughs> that guy, spiritually dead. Then we go another field trip. We go to Charlotte and we go to Skid Row. And there's a lady there. She's homeless, living in a cardboard box. She's got track marks all over both arms. And she's an addict. She's had multiple children, has nothing to do with any of them because she has one goal in life. Give me a fix. I got to have some more heroin. I'm addicted to it. And, and we feel sorry for her. We want to help her, but we walk away and we go, man, that woman is spiritually dead, lost. There's no spiritual life there. But what about the lady who lives in the million dollar home on Caswell Beach or St. James or Southport. And she doesn't have track marks on her arms, just the opposite. She volunteers at the homeless shelter. She dresses nice, talks well. She loves her family. She even comes to Generations Church. But she is 
spiritually dead. She's religious, has it all together on the outside, but on the inside, she's spiritually dead. See, it's possible to be spiritually dead and not even know it. Maybe you're spiritually dead and don't know it. If, if you don't know it, there are two things that'll keep you spiritually dead and blind to it. Two things, religion and prosperity. So let's talk about religion a second. See, I have conversations with, some, with people sometimes and I'll ask them, you know, spiritual questions. I'll ask a question like, have you ever been born again? Have you ever trusted Christ? I never ask someone, are you a Christian? Because some people think, man, if I was born in America, I'm a Christian. So I try to be real specific. Have you trusted Christ as your savior? And sometimes people, instead of giving me, yes, this is what happened to me, their testimony, they'll give me a religious answer. They'll go, well, I've, I've always believed in God. I grew up in church. Well, you know, Pastor Troy, I really try to live a good life, try to be a good person. I didn't ask if you're religious. I ask you, does the Holy Spirit live on the inside of you? Have you been born again? Then there's prosperity. Prosperity is a tough one because prosperity will keep us from realizing we're spiritually dead because we can numb the pain with stuff. And again, I, I talk to people and many of you who attend generations, you invite people to generations or, or maybe you engage people in spiritual conversations. And I can always tell when this one Pretty early on, I can tell when this one's keeping from some, somebody from God because their eyes will glaze over, maybe their body will stiffen. And, and, and rarely are people rude to me. Maybe I'm a pastor, I don't know why, when I invite them to church or whatever, they might even come a time or two. But if they're infected with this prosperity, then they're really not interested in God or the Bible or being a part of church, because man, we got too much golf to play. We got too much traveling to do. We can, even though there's spiritual brokenness and spiritual emptiness, if we've got enough of the green, we've got enough of the money, we can buy things. We can make connections with people that will numb the pain of spiritual death, but on the inside, they're spiritually dead. And what I'm praying that you'll see today in this very honest passage from the book of Ephesians is that if you are spiritually dead, that, that you'll move to a place where you go, you know what? We're not good, pretty good people in need of improvement. That's religion. We're not uh, mistakers in need of a life coach. We are lost people in need of a savior. We are dead people in need of life. That's why Jesus came. All right, I've talked enough. Here's what God's word says. And, uh, and, and what I'll do is I'm, I'm gonna teach from right here on the monitor, but we'll put the whole passage on the screen behind me just so you'll know I'm not making it up. It's in the Bible, it's there. Uh, so you can, and if you get lost, you can always kind of go back to there, but that's where we're going. We're going to Ephesians 2, one through 10, one of the most famous passages in all the Bible. Start in verse one. As for you, you were D-E-A-D. -E you were dead before Christ. Now, Paul's talking to Ephesians Christians. He's talking to us, inspired by the Lord. He's talking to us. Before Christ, though, we were, we were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's Satan, demonic world. We'll talk about it in a second. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. I love how Paul put us all on level ground here because he's addressing, as I said, Christians, Christ followers, people who used to be dead but are now alive. And he's, and he's basically saying, it's a good reminder, don't forget who you were. Don't forget before the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you and began the process of transformation that this is what our life used to look like. 
Like we used to be this way. And sometimes for those of us who are Christ followers, uh, this is just a good reminder because sometimes we get a little bit high and mighty. And I know I get guilty of this because the Holy Spirit's transforming us and, you know, it's a long way from where we used to be. And, and then we make comments like we expect people who are spiritually dead to act like they're spiritually alive. We go, can you believe they moved in together before they got married? Can you believe they got so drunk at that party? Yeah, I can believe it because we used to do that too. And still do sometimes when we ignore God's Holy Spirit inside of us. So Paul's going like, you know, this is the way we used to live. And, he, and, he, and then he goes, okay, here, here's what our problem is. He lays out three problems that we had and why we desperately need a Savior. If you're taking notes, jot these down. These are real important. I just read them, but I want to kind of unpack the passage for you. Here's our first problem. We're dead in sin. We are dead. Now, this idea... If you're brand new to church, this idea could be offensive to you because you're like, Troy, I'm not dead. Why do you keep saying that? Like my, my brain works good. You know, my body is in great shape. I am, I am very much alive. So if you're offended by it, you're, you're in good company because a lot of people were offended by it. Matter of fact, when Jesus Christ walked this earth, he offended a guy named Nicodemus. You can read about it in John chapter three. Nicodemus, I promise he was more religious than you are. He's a guy who's like the, a teacher of Israel, member of the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, very, very religious guy. Had it, you know, on the outside, great. Jesus looked at him in the eyes and said, you're dead. And unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus is like, seriously? What am I supposed to do? Go back in my mother's womb, start all over again? Jesus is like, look, here's the problem, Nicodemus. Humans like you love darkness more than light. I'm kind of summarizing what Jesus said to him. And here's what you have to do. You have to be born physically, check, you got that one. But then you have to be born again spiritually because you're dead and you have to be born again. And, um, and, you know, again, Nicodemus kind of, you know, bristled at it. But, it. but that's what Jesus was teaching. And Paul mentions two words for us that brought us to this place of being a living corpse. He said, we are dead in our transgressions and sins. So transgressions is a Greek word, peripatoma, which means an intentional false step. So it's like God put a boundary here and said, don't cross the boundary. And we're like, mm, I want to. Eve said in the Garden of Eden, I know God said, don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but man, it looks so delicious. And, and it's gonna make me smart. Crunch. And she ate it. And, and, and when she did, God had warned her ahead of time, when you do that, Adam and Eve, you will die. Adam did it right after her and they died. Physically, yes, eventually they did, but um, it immediately died spiritually, separated from God. Same thing in our life. I'm sitting there eating a meal and I'm full. I've had a good meal and there's a piece of cheesecake over there in front of me and the Holy Spirit says, don't be a glutton, don't eat that. And I go, but Tabitha, I'll start on Monday because <laughs> Tabitha and the Holy Spirit, my wife, they sound the same sometimes. I don't know, it drives me crazy. But you know, like, no, I'll start the dot on Monday. And then I eat the piece of cheesecake because I'm a glutton and I, cho I choose sin sometimes. That's what I've done and you have as well. The other Greek word, you know, is transgression. So that's intentional. And then sins is the Greek word hamara. It's a very common word in, in the Greek New Testament. And it's a word that's used for sin. And, and what it means is uh, basically it's, it's the missing of a mark. So God says, this is my standard of holiness and we fail to, uh, to meet that standard. We fail to achieve it. So um, God says, love your enemies. You know, love your neighbor like you love yourself. And we go, I don't want to love them. I don't want to do, I want to be angry at them. I, I don't want to forgive them for whatever wrong they've done. And so Paul's going like through, through the sins of commission and through the sins of omission, both ways. Sins we ignore, not, you know, not make, missing, we're missing the mark, but, but also intentionally sinning, commission, 
we have sinned and that sin has separated us from God. We're dead in sin, but it gets worse. We're also enslaved by sin. We talked about this last week, but what the Bible means when it says we're enslaved, it means that we, it, it, it doesn't feel like we have chains on us. Like we don't see, you know, physical chains, but we have chains because it means that we follow naturally the ways of the world, two things, the ways of the world and the desires of our flesh. So he says, we follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's basically saying we follow the demonic powers in this world that have been set up by Satan and the, and the evil ruler of the air. It doesn't mean like, you know, we go to, before Christ, we went to satanic church and we killed cats and we drank blood and we put curses on people. And now we're Christians. So we, now we go to a Christian church and we drink coffee and we sing praises and we pray for people. It's, it's more subtle than that. Satan is so subtle. He's a master of deceit. So what it is, he set up this world that hates God that rebels against God's word. You see it in the culture, you see it in the movies. And before Christ, we used to be entertained by that. We laughed at when people mocked God. We would curse God. We thought it was funny that people broke God's commandments. That's what it means to follow the spirit of the air. And then of course, also, it's just that, that bondage to the flesh is also, we're, we're gratifying, he, Paul says, we gratify the, the cravings of our flesh and we followed his desires and thoughts. It was just natural for us to do that. Our flesh, he doesn't mean like what covers our bones. He's talking about our sin nature. It's, it's another word for the sin nature we're born with is another word for flesh. So when you read flesh in the Bible, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this desire inside of us to want to please ourselves. If it feels good, do it. That kind of mentality that we're sort of born with and we're trying to do. And, and what we do, the longer we try to gratify that sinful nature, that flesh, it puts us deeper and deeper in bondage. And I, and I know some of your teenagers and you have the mentality, I had this mentality when I was a teenager. I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof. I can drink what I wanna drink, smoke what I wanna smoke, sleep with whoever I wanna sleep with. And there's no consequences to that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, big, I'm a big deal, right? Nothing's gonna take me out. I wish you could sit in some conversations I've had with people who have gratified the sinful nature for 20 or 30 or 40 years. And just to hear how every morning they wake up, it is a battle to overcome the addiction to alcohol, to overcome the addiction to pornography because they've gratified and now they're in bondage to that flesh. It's just so clear to see the, the older we get. So your philosophy before Christ feels good, do it. Afterwards, our flesh is still weak, but now the Holy Spirit lives inside of us because we've been born again. So now there's a battle going on. And, 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 and we don't want to do those things that our flesh wants to do. So you were in a pretty good mood when you came to church today. But so far you've learned you're dead in sin. You're enslaved by sin. But wait, it gets even worse. Hang on, it's going to get better, okay? I, but I want to teach this because I want to be honest with what the Bible's teaching. Third one is we're condemned by sin. Worst part of all, probably. Like the rest, Paul says, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Like you're either under the blood of Jesus or you're under the wrath of God. That, that's the only place you can be. So we were deserving of wrath because God in his holiness doesn't say, doesn't wink at sin and go, it's all good, I'll let you in. Doesn't, doesn't work that way. Here's the definition of God's wrath. God's personal righteous constant hostility to evil. His settled refusal to compromise with it and his resolve instead to condemn it. And that's important to understand. God's wrath is different than our wrath. God doesn't have temper tantrum. He's not vindictive. He's not spiteful. He's not, you know, like just loses cool on you. No, God's thoughtful. He's not arbitrary in, in his punishment. He's holy and he's just and his wrath is like his love. He does, it is faithful. He keeps his promises. So God won't wink at sin and act like it's no big deal but nor will he punish sin more than it deserves. He is fair and just. I love what John Stott in his 
commentary on Ephesians said about the wrath of God. He said, we need, I think, to be more grateful to God for his wrath. Never thought about being grateful for it. And to worship him that because his righteousness is perfect, he always reacts to evil in the same unchanging, predictable, uncompromising way. Without his moral constancy, constancy, we could enjoy no peace. And we couldn't. Like, I, I know, you know, thank God he's not arbitrary because he keeps his word. And I know you may not love the fact that God punishes your sin, but you would hate God even worse if God was arbitrary in his punishment. He just woke up one day and felt like, okay, I'm just gonna destroy anybody who commits whatever sin. No, God is faithful. He keeps his promises in every way. Now, if we stop there, this would be horrible news. God's holy, we're not, good luck to you. But thank God, he is just, but he's also the justifier. He's the one who makes a way for our sins to be atoned for. And now we get to verse four. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. We were spiritually dead. He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. It's past tense. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Do you see the language here? It is God saved you. God has exalted you. Like it's all past tense because God has done it. We have been saved past tense. We have been forgiven, past tense. We have been seated with Christ because Christ is seated next to the Father in heaven. What happened to Christ happens to us because we've been united with him. So we've been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. I talked about this little phrase last week, heavenly realms. It doesn't mean the heavens like the sweet by and by the glory of heaven. It means the unseen spiritual world that we live in right now. God has seated us with Christ like we have the Holy Spirit we have authority over the unseen spiritual world. We have the gifts of the Spirit. We have the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. We have the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. We have that. Why would God do all this for us? I read it because of his great love for us. Because God loves you. That little song you learned when you were in vacation Bible school as a kid, yes, Jesus loves the little children. It is so true. God loves you at your age with all the sins you've committed. God loves you. He really does. He loves you. And I know this is like maybe your first time back in church in a long time. And so far in the sermon, like everything I've said has met your suspicions. Yeah, you are, you sinned against God and God's wrath is coming for you and you're guilty and you felt all that. So don't miss this part. God loves you and because he loves you so much, he fought for you. He died for you. He wants you, he chose you to be with him for all of eternity. Why would he do that? Because he loves us, but also because he's rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in a lot of things. He owns all the money and all the gold and all the diamonds in all the world. Rich in resources, but even more important, he's rich in mercy. I love his mercy. You know what his mercy is? It's getting what we don't deserve. God is merciful to us. He gives us what we don't deserve. I memorized a verse many years ago in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 where Jesus was talking and he said, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. I memorized that and it's helped me to be merciful to other people sometimes, you know, given forgiveness or, 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 or something to them because here's why. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. I need mercy. I screw up a lot. You can ask my wife and my kids. I mean, you can ask people who've been coming to this church for a while. I say dumb things sometimes. I do dumb things. So I need people to be merciful to me. So blessed are the merciful. They shall receive mercy. And praise God that he is merciful to us. 
We don't, we don't get what we deserve. Like what we deserve is punishment. What we deserve are, like, are you like me? Have you ever made promises to God? God, I promise I'll do this if you'll do this for me. And then we break our promises to God. But God's merciful anyway. He's kind and he, we, we, don't, we don't get what we deserve and thank God for that. Now, thank God for his mercy. Because of his mercy, drum roll, now we get to a couple of the greatest verses in all the Bible. A lot of theology here. Here we go. Verse eight. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So what's saved? Going to heaven, forgiven of our sin, a relationship with God for all times. That came not through you and I trying hard, not through us being religious, not through coming to church a lot, doing good things, giving away money. No, it came through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how salvation comes. That's how, and it's a gift of God, not by works, not by religion, so that no one can boast. Wow. Let me ask you this. Just be honest with me. Um, how many of here at some point in your life had this mindset, had this theology that I will be saved, forgiven, go to heaven if I am a, a good person, if I'm very religious. I used to feel that way. Is there anybody else besides me used to think, if I'm religious, if I go to church, I'll go to heaven. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah, and the rest of them are lying because we all, <laughs> no, maybe you didn't. But all of us kind of had that thought one time, like if I'll be good, maybe my good will outweigh my bad and I'll get into heaven. Can, can we just put that to bed? That's a lie. No, that's a lie. We're not saved through our goodness. We're saved through faith. But, but it, Troy, isn't having faith in God a good work? Well, yeah, kind of, but it's more like receiving a gift. That's why he says it. It's a gift. You, you know, we adults are not good at receiving gifts. Our kids are great at it. Like you've never had your kid at Christmas time go, Mom and Dad, stop, stop. I know there's five more presents, but I'm just, I can't open them anymore. I don't want any more gifts. You know, they're like, bring it on, you know? That's why Jesus said, if you want to be saved, you want eternal life, you got to become like a child. Let's be good at like receiving this gift. We can't, we have to get to the place where we go, I can't earn this. It's a gift given by God. And all I can do is reach out and I can take it and I can receive it. And I love that Paul says, so that no one can boast, just, just in case you're not clear, there's no one that's going to be in heaven going, I'm here, baby, because I am good. I am one good dude. I earned it. I'm here because God needed me in heaven. No, man, no one's going to be there because they can boast about being there. They're there because they received the free gift of eternal life that God promised through his son, Jesus Christ. When I was a teenager, I had an opportunity to be a lifeguard, so I was required to take a you know, you take swimming lessons while well, I had to take this lifeguard lessons or, or life-saving lessons. And I don't remember a lot from the class. So, so if we're at the beach, please don't go out and get, you know, in the rip current or something because we're all in trouble. But, but I do remember one lesson that my teacher taught us and she was such a great teacher. And I mean, she just really reinforced this one. And she basically said this, look, if someone is drowning, and, and, you know, they're, they're flailing and they're going under. She said, you've got two options on how to save them, how to rescue them. The first option is do not, under any circumstances, go near them and hold out your hand or go. Because she said, she said two people are going to drown instead of one. Because when they're out of control and they're, they're panicking, they're going to do everything they can. They're going to put you under and all that, especially if they're an adult and they're, you know, they're big and all that. Don't do it. She said, so get a pole, get an inner tube, get a, you know, a noodle, get whatever. You can reach out to them, stay away, reach out to them so they can grab it and you can bring them to the side of the pool or bring them to the beach or whatever. The second option, if you don't have a pole, if you don't have something inflatable, the second one's not great, but it's, it's the only way. She said, so if you don't have that, basically what you have to do is let them drown. Not die, but let them stop flailing. In other words, that once they go down a few times, they swallow enough water 
and they're you know unconscious, whatever. Then you you come behind them, go to their back, come behind them, put your arm around their chest, and you drag them back to the side of the pool. And then she taught us CPR and how to get the water out of their lungs and you know put air back in their lungs and get their their heart beating again and all that. So I tell you that story because of this. Some of you here, listen to me. You're drowning in sin. You're, you're dead in sin. You are, you are flailing. Because here's what's it. You're drowning in sin and you, maybe you realize it. And part of you realize it was coming to church today, tuning in online. Because, man, you're just like, oh, I got to do something. So you're, you're doing religious things. You're trying to be a good person. You're trying to save yourself. Listen, the greatest thing you can do today is lean back in the arms of Jesus Christ. Let him put his arm around you, around your chest. Just breathe, relax, stop flailing, and trust him. He's the only way you can be saved. That's why God sent his only son, because his perfect sacrifice on the cross, his blood that was shed for us, is the only way that we can be saved. We can't earn it. So stop trying to earn it. It is by faith you were saved. So put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And then, watch this. When we do this, last verse, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, what happens sometimes is we get the order reversed. We're like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do good works in order to save myself. No, 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 no. We, we get saved first. We, we trust in Jesus Christ and we're born again and we go from death to life and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and now we have a desire to want to do good works. We have a desire to want to please the Lord, not to earn our salvation, but because we've already been saved. Do you see how the order is correct here? We got to get saved first and then verse 10 happens. Then we serve the Lord with gladness. Then we use the gifts he's given us to serve him and to build his kingdom and to help other people who are spiritually dead to find life. So here's the application today, really simple. Number one, if you've never trusted Jesus, trust in him, place your faith in him, stop flailing, stop drowning in sin and go, Lord, I'm gonna lean on you. I'm all in, Jesus. I repent of my sin and I trust you. That's the first thing. If you've done that, okay. Now, if you've done that, you've trusted Christ and you're spiritually alive and you're a Christian, let's go. Let's get on with verse 10. We've got some good works to do. We've got some things the Lord wants us to do. Our church is growing. We're reaching people in this area. So we're praying about adding a third service. Probably gonna be a Saturday night service. It's coming, but it takes about 200 volunteers for us to do an, an additional service. So if you're sitting on the sidelines and you're not in the game, it's time to get in the game. Generations Church needs you to hold babies and park cars and love people and do verse 10. You're born again, you're alive. So let's get on with living and building God's kingdom, helping other people who are far from God, who are spiritually dead, find life in Jesus Christ. We need you on the team. How you do that? 94,000. If you trusted Christ as your savior today, 94,000. If you wanna serve and volunteer here, text the word GC Connect and we'll help you get connected and help us be a part of what God's doing at Generations Church. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Now here's the first part. Here's the most important part I want you to hear today. If, if that first thing I said, if you're, if you're separated from God, dead in sin, because you've never trusted him. Here's what I want you to say to him. I'm not gonna pray it for you. I want you to pray it to the Lord. Just say to him, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for the wrong things that I've done that I realize have separated me from you. And I wanna trust you by faith. I believe Jesus, you died on the cross for me. And so Lord, make me spiritually alive today. Come into my heart, Jesus, and be my savior and be my Lord. You pray that to the Lord, I promise you, you're gonna walk out of Generations Church a different human being today. I wanna pray for you as I pray. You pray that prayer to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word that's truth. 
Thank you, Lord, that you opened our blind eyes. That, that so many of us here just were religious for years, tried to earn our salvation, tried to be a good person. Lord, thank you that you've shown us that it's really what you did for us. And so, Lord, I pray for my friends who are here today who have never received the free gift of eternal life. I pray that they would call upon your name, Jesus, they would be saved, and they would come alive today, and that we could celebrate their resurrection from the dead, spiritual resurrection um, in, in the coming days, Lord, as they are ready to go public with that. And I just, Lord, pray for all of us here, Lord, that you show us our part in, in doing the works that you called us to do, that you created us to do. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen.